Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Digging In. This is our seventh episode of season five. We're just going to allow a minute or two for people to come into the webinar space, uh, and then I will uh, do some introductions and comments. Settle in with a cup of coffee or a bowl of soup or whatever fits your fancy uh, at this moment. We are welcoming you to Digging In. My name is Suanna Crowley. Okay, let's begin. As I said, uh, welcome to episode seven of Digging In. This is our fifth season uh, of this recurring conversation series with archeologists and researchers. Uh, I am Suanna Crowley. I am past president of the Massachusetts Archeological Society and a trustee. Uh, I'm also a geoarchaeologist in New England. Uh, today, I am filling in for Lindsay Randall, your regular host, um, and I expect that she'll be back for episode eight. Digging In is a series of live presentations with scholars from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We like to begin with a land acknowledgement uh, for the land that the Peabody Institute uh, and its school, Phillips Academy, are on. So please just give me a moment to, to proceed with that. Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Penacook and the Pawtucket peoples and the lands of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, Poconocut, and Nipmuc nations. We honor all indigenous peoples who are here now, who have been here for time immemorial and will be here in the future. We acknowledge indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of native peoples, voices, cultures, and spiritualities. We understand how education has been used by settler institutions in the attempted erasure of indigenous peoples. We commit to interrogating these histories of and our complicity in colonization, centering native voices and communities and dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism at Phillips Academy and beyond. Thank you. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. I uh, wanna make you aware that you're welcome to join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time through December for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, you're welcome to visit us at peabody.andover.edu or massarchaeology.org. And if you enjoy this programming, and we certainly hope that you do, please consider expanding your impact by becoming a member or donor to the Mass Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you this really innovative and outstanding programming uh, with the support of viewers like you. So today we're very excited to welcome Dr. Annie Danis, an assistant professor of anthropology at Cal Poly Pomona. She's coming to us from the opposite coast, so it's early for her, uh, but we're very glad to have her for those of us who are here in New England watching. Her interdisciplinary research practice explores historical and contemporary landscapes of inequality in the Western United States. She combines anthropology, art, and community engagement to produce meaningful research by, with, and for indigenous, Latinx, and Japanese American communities. Her most recent publication, Homeless Place and Homemaking at the Albany Bulb, is in the archeological papers of the American Anthropological Association, adds a community-based, which adds a community-based approach to a growing body of archeological research on contemporary homelessness. Now, uh, before I give the floor uh, to Dr. Danis, I just wanna let you know that I will be here um, preparing for the conclusion of the talk and monitoring uh, the chat and the Q&A. Should you have any questions, you are welcome to submit those directly. Uh, and then we will have some time to, to offer uh, our speaker maybe as much uh, as they possibly can, um, acknowledging that she is in the middle of her workday and on to other things. So without further ado, uh, we welcome Dr. Danis, and thank you for joining us today. Please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Saves me from doing my own. Um, so I'm here today to talk about archaeology of homemaking with homeless communities, uh, in particular, a project um, of engaged archaeology at a place called the Albany Bull in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area here on the west coast of California. Um, I would like to start with my own land acknowledgement that I'm zooming in from uh, Tongva Gabrielino, 
uh, traditional and unceded territory, what is now Los Angeles County. Um, and that the site I'm going to discuss is in Kuchin, the sovereign and unceded lands of the Ohlone people. Um, and here you can see a map um, from the um, ever useful nativelands.ca website um, showing the Muwekwa and Chochenyo uh, Ohlone um, traditional territories. And all the way up here in this little red circle at the top of the screen is the site that I'm going to be discussing today. So um, the work I'm going to talk about is part of a particularly North American style of archaeology of the contemporary. The idea that we can look at material culture of the immediate minute ago past um, in order to understand better uh, the world that we live in and some of the problems that people face. Um, this kind of archaeology is motivated by the needs of contemporary people and interweaves traditional archaeological methods with um, ways of working inspired by indigenous Black and Latinx archaeologies uh, and community-based work. So in thinking about the archaeology of homelessness, and in particular, an archaeology at a place called the Albany Bulb, um, what I tried to do is exactly that. Determine the course of research based on the needs of the people who were living um, in this public park. Um, and one of the main interests that folks had in archaeology was that archaeology produces authoritative documents. It produces a narrative um, that is seen as more legitimate than the speech and the statements of people themselves uh, because of the power imbalances involved in um, negotiating even to the level of citizenship uh, your place as a homeless person. Um, so I'll discuss how, um, how that worked in this particular project and how it might work in futures of future archaeologies um, dealing with unhoused uh, populations. Um, and I will also discuss how the results of this archaeological investigation demonstrate that there's a, a real need to rethink the definition or the stereotypes associated with the experience of homelessness. This homogenizing category, homeless, erases the agency and creativity with which residents of the Albany Bulb and elsewhere build homes uh, in non-normative ways. So what I came to find is that this project was not an archaeology of homelessness per se, but an archaeology of homemaking uh, with a population who has been labeled homeless. Um, and that was all the result of doing engaged research, uh, community-based um, development of the research design uh, through its presentation and interpretation. So to do this, I will tell the story of the Albany Bulb from the creation of the landform itself um, to about 2014, and then the story of the archaeological work, um, and then discuss these interpretations, how archaeological attention prompted a rethinking of um, homelessness to include the ideas of living outside or non-normative homemaking, and how the authority of archaeological documents um, and the narratives we produce can be an important tool in historical justice or the right to be remembered for populations like this one. So some of the residents of the Albany Bulb, again, on the San Francisco uh, Bay, just north of Berkeley, California in a city called Albany, hence the name, these residents sometimes called themselves landfillians because the peninsula, um, which you see in the satellite image here, was formed by 20 plus years of dumping 
in particular construction debris. So the main element of this dump, which you can uh, track in the USGS maps on the right-hand side of this screen, um, began in 1963 um, and continued until 1983. Um, it's preceded by infill, so filling in the marshlands of the bay to build what you also see on these maps, which is a railroad uh, line and a racetrack um, before it becomes a place of a formal dump. So the Albany bulb is 32 square miles. It's a significant um, plot of land. And um, environmental impact reports have estimated that it houses 2 million cubic yards of waste um, at an average depth of about 40 feet. So you can see how this landform itself is an artifact. Um, is the result of the patterned disposal of materials. And the dump is then commissioned in 1983. And in the early 1990s, um, people start living on this sort of new topography of the overgrown peninsula. Um, and it's a little unclear how that exactly happened. But the place becomes a sort of unregulated space on the outskirts of the city of Albany. So these jutting concrete mounds that you see here, rocky shores, become a backdrop for a constantly evolving set of paintings, sculptures, and structures. Homes, which I'll talk more about here, but also a library, a labyrinth, an amphitheater built both by the folks who are living there, sometimes calling themselves landfillians, and visitors. Um, so it is a public place that folks also come to walk their dogs, to um, windsurf off the shores of. Um, and these people sort of coexisted in the same land landscape while the city was lax in enforcing a no camping law. So here you can see an example of this sort of found object driftwood sculpture um, of which there's many, uh, many pieces still today. Uh, one of these rock labyrinths made not out of rock, but broken concrete and brick uh, and slag. And so for about 20 years, folks lived and recreated in, in this landscape. And in 2014, the city of Albany decides to um, push forward plans to transfer the land to the regional parks district um, to sort of get rid of it, so to speak. And this initiates a big um, eviction, the beginnings of enforcing a no camping law that was previously sort of um, very lax and uh, a legal battle. So you can see here, one of the residents, Amber Whitson, um, is putting up signs like the one on the left in front of her home um, while being you know, constantly harassed by police. And on the right is actually calculating the square footage um, that each resident at the bulb at that time was occupying. So the results of this struggle, which essentially is a class struggle um, between folks who are living on public land and those who want to regulate it, um, resulted in a complete eviction of all of the residents of the bulb. Um, and they could follow the terms of a settlement, which asked them to dismantle their homes and sign a stay away order for a year in exchange for $3,000. Let me point out, even though it has increased today, today the median studio apartment rental price in the city of Albany is $1,850. And only 20% of the rental market is below $2,000 a month. So you can see how while $3,000 appears generous, it's not a sustainable option 
for folks who had essentially stable homes here at the Albany Bulb. So right after these evictions finally took place and homes were dismantled, I was introduced uh, by Susan Moffat from UC Berkeley to uh, the person you see here, Amber Whitson, who introduced me to the bulb and challenged me to use archeology span in order to help assert the presence and the importance of this place to uh, her and the other landfillian residents. And this created a challenge for engaged research uh, because as this pretty tight knit community had been spread across the city and into other cities, they were a distributed and um, markedly um, under-resourced population. So what I tried to do was, although I could not visit the sites of people's homes with them, and I could not find many of them, I used the language and the narratives that they themselves had created through news articles, uh, short documentaries, and other um, media objects to understand this place as a place of homes. And so we uh, did a systematic survey of half of this bulb area to identify home sites um, and judge the sort of density of occupation. And then we did a complete resident guided tour of the bulb or survey of the bulb in which we were given tours to home sites by folks like Amber who had not taken the stay away order um, and worked with uh, maps for other folks to identify where their home sites were. And in this survey, we cre created a database of 1,200 images. We surveyed 42 home sites um, using um, samples of one meter by one meter um, grids, and we completed site mapping. And you can see on the right one of our maps here that we um, screen printed on fabric for a uh, art installation. So the homes of this place um, look like you see here, Boxer Bob's house, um, a multi-story uh, construction right on the edge of the bulb looking out the entire over the entire Bay Area. Um, you can see three bridges from his home, which is uh, in the Bay Area, um, some real real estate. Um, but they also included tent and tarp constructions, um, hobbit holes, uh, which folks use to call um, houses dug into the root structures of trees. Um, and they were notably using the landscape to create places where they could feel alone in this landscape of recreation and other people. So a lot of these homes are tucked away using the, the view shed of this very dynamic dump topography. And we also documented the kinds of artifacts that folks were forced to leave behind. Um, seashells, teacups, and tiny toys in particular um, indicated these aesthetic choices, these decorative elements to homes. And we also were able to identify defined activity areas in which kitchen work would happen, sleeping, entertaining, um, as well as gardens and landscaping. So in this image here, you see Stephanie's home, again, on another point looking out over uh, a part of the bay with these neatly tended um, gardens. This is about mm, maybe five months after eviction, these images. Um, and you can see that they're starting to become overgrown, but they include not only um, bushes and trees, but transplanted succulents and other um, more unusual plants. So if we think about home uh, and its anthropological definition 
of a connection to place and a pattern of dwelling rather than perhaps it's modern colloquial use uh, that represents a particular kind of structure, a particular kind of tenancy or land ownership. What the archeology span shows us is what folks at the bulb themselves already knew, that these places re remain places of homemaking. Thinking about the way homes and households are identified through time in archeology, span again, we think of these defined activity areas. So in the image on the right of Pat and Carrie's home, uh, you can see this, um, this grid pattern, which is made by an impeccably laid brick floor in which um, Pat, one of the residents, collected bricks from around the site, historic bricks, um, and reused them to create the floor of his sleeping area, their bedroom, essentially, underneath a, a big shaded tree that would create the superstructure for tarps and other kinds of siding. So in addition to thinking about these places as homes, what the gardening and the decoration evident in the archeology span and the oral histories of this place show us is also an expression of self-identity and practices of care, which are things that are often uh, denied this particular community, folks experiencing homelessness, and really challenges us to think of the homefulness of dwelling in place despite being outside of the normal tenancy system, um, outside of home ownership, or in places where there are no addresses. Um, and we can see that at least some people, while there's a range of experiences, at least some people, um, at least about 25 people at the time of eviction, if not more, felt at home at the bulb. And we have those material signatures of that experience as well as their own expression. And this makes the city's forcible removal of people from their homes an act of eviction. And this idea of archeological authority and historical justice helps me understand the importance of doing work like this. Because as I said, paying attention to the material of homemaking reveals a cultural landscape that's usually denied people experiencing homelessness. Um, we start to understand things like the language used in city planning documents. So I did a full survey as well of all of the um, posters, calls for input, PowerPoints from community meetings, legal documents that the city of Albany created during this time of evicting residents from the bulb. And these documents set up an adversarial relationship between residents and their homes on the one hand, and the development of the Albany bulb as a public park, essentially excluding those people who are living there from this category of public. And they repeatedly call these evictions cleanups, referring, referring to people's homes and belongings as hazards or tra trash, and only once or twice acknowledging the existence of people for whom those places are homes and those objects, belongings. And this really strongly paralyzes how the material belongings of migrants crossing the US-Mexico border are characterized as trash. So in his book, Land of Open Graves, um, anthropologist Jason de Leon talks about how reducing those things that belong to migrants that are left in the desert, reducing them to garbage is not only a value judgment, it compresses a diverse range of materials into a problematic category and makes it impossible for us to assert the humanity, the individual individuality, um, and the importance of those people for whom the objects are traces. So 
this investigation of homemaking at the Albany Bulb through its material traces in collaboration with a community counters the continued erasure that these people experienced in their dealings with the city of Albany. And archeological products, these 42 maps of home sites, these 1200 photos of activity areas, objects left behind, the narratives and the archives that the project creates assert this value of landfillian material, the culture belonging and homes of folks living at the Albany Bulb as an archive of experience, but it also asserts the right to be remembered. This idea that although folks have already been evicted, memory work can and should be done at this site in order to value the 20 years of homemaking, of belonging um, and sharing that landfillians experienced. Um, and this we might even attach in a very small way to the idea of historical justice, that this work is both generating value and communicating experiences to, for example, the citizens of Albany who are part of the process of eviction, that folks are in fact doing a lot of the same things that they do at their own homes. Um, and in fact, Amber Whitson, one of my collaborators, uh, was in one of our community meetings where we were editing and augmenting the site maps. And I, I asked her, I was like, do these mean anything to you? You know, we spent a lot of time and a lot of attention at each of these sites. Is this worth it, do you think? And she said, it absolutely is. But I just wish the people of Albany could see this. So, an important aspect of doing work with people experiencing homelessness um, is not just to you know, file that documentation away with the regional parks so that they know there's a contemporary cultural resource, but actually share it with the community. So again, through these we a series of community meetings, participation in art exhibitions, um, and other forms of presentation, we tried to close that loop, to make this research meaningful to the folks whose homes we documented um, by sharing this with the people that they um, felt had a misunderstanding about their life at the Albany Bowl. So, uh, as was mentioned, uh, further uh, detail about this work um, and how the archeology span intersects with um, issues of homelessness in the Bay Area um, is part of my contribution to a special issue of the American, uh, Archeolo the Archeological Papers of the American Anthrop Association of Anthropologists, <laughs> excuse me. Um, AP3A, for those of you uh, who are familiar, uh, in a uh, really interesting volume called Contemporary Archaeologies in Old Places, Material Politics Between Past and Future. Um, and if you have interest in the ways that archaeology of the contemporary and with contemporary communities reaches back uh, into time, I highly recommend the entire volume. Um, there's also uh, samples of the maps and photographs that this project created in Counterpoints, an atlas of displacement and resistance, um, which you can um, take a look at and order uh, at antievictionmap.com. Um, and uh, this was one of the projects that I discuss in Landscapes of Inequality, Creative Approaches to Engaged Research. Uh, my dissertation, which is available through ProQuest and on my website. So I appreciate your time. There are many aspects of this project um, that I 
wasn't able to go in depth on. So I welcome your questions uh, and I can share more. Thank you, Dr. Danis. What a special conversation that you've given us today in terms of just thinking, uh, you know, our, our archaeological brains are, are, you know, very practiced to look at certain kinds of material culture. And I think you've really given us a stretch today, um, but but connected it so, so beautifully, so successfully. Um, so we're just going to wait a minute here for uh, anyone to pop a question into the chat, but I'd love to ask you one that that came up for me. Um, some of the work that I did uh, as a graduate student um, was really focused on the ancient Near East, um, learning the, the languages of um, uh, the Mesopotamian region. Um, and part of the work that I did for my um, master's project was really looking at nomadic populations that were living on the outskirts and transiting between some of the major city-states. And there's just, I just immediately reacted in this way to feel like there, there's just such a sense of parallel going on here mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the difficulty of seeing those very ancient populations and discerning their material culture uh, and, and having um, such a rich body of material culture here to talk about and to to mark issues of identity. Um, I, I feel like there's there's just something so instructive from your work to to cast uh, into into other regions and other time frames. Absolutely. I think the the sort of um, trajectory of archaeologies of homelessness has been inspired by this. Um, so, so one thing that we can do is not just to apply our understandings of um, mobile peoples from the past onto contemporary populations, but actually understand what the context that creates those mobile and, and supports or doesn't support those mobile populations in the present and in the past. Um, and those content, those social contexts can be very different. For homelessness in the present, there's a very, um, especially in the United States, there's a sort of marked history that goes back about only like 100, 150 years in terms of the population of people being described as homeless, um, being assumed to be both mobile untethered, but also um, carrying negative associations about um, sociality and, you know, citizenship and things like that. So what would be really interesting would be to take those Near Eastern cases and use the both similarities and differences to look at what are those social conditions? How are, how are these mobile communities integrated or not integrated into things like the economic world. So for example, at the Albany Bulb, um, folks are extremely resourceful. They have a lot of raw material right where they are. They There's a Costco that's up the bike path that has excellent dumpsters. There's a scrap yard down the bike path where you can um, essentially mine the copper wire and other metals out of the bulb itself and uh, trade that for money. So that actually creates a context in which folks at the bulb are not that mobile. They're establishing um, kind of homes for up to a decade. Um, and, and I think that this is one of the exciting realms to continue doing work with homeless populations is to really understand the diversity of these experiences. Um, Absolutely. I think there's just a, a tremendous amount to gain for, for our understanding of the past, but uh, for our, our understanding of the, the contemporary for the moment. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a quick note to one of uh, the folks who wrote in to Anne, who noted that the chat is disabled. I've tried to fix that on the back end. I apologize if that is happening, but you are welcome to come into the Q&A, which is functioning. Uh, so please do so with, with a question. Um, Joshua wanted to ask, can you talk about talk more about the idea of practices of care for both a resident's life, community, and with the sharing giving back end at the back end of the project? Sure. Um, 
I'll actually take the, the last part of that question first, which is one of the goals of the project from the beginning was for this research to involve practices of care because of the realities of the group of people whose homes we were looking at. Um, so a lot of the work involved caring for those individuals that we still had connections with in small ways through the archeology. span So we have a crew out there, we have food, snacks, drinks, whatever, anybody coming by, you know, can take things, can just talk with us, um, can tell us to stop doing something. Uh, and while that doesn't hit the immediate population who has a stay away order, it sort of expands to the greater community. So from the very beginning, a practice of care was involved in the research design because it was collaborative with folks like Amber who came and worked with us. Um, and one of the things that residents themselves talked about was of course, challenges that any community has and conflict and their own personal challenges and mental health and drug abuse and, you know, all of those things, but also how much they cared for each other. So there was sort of a, a community kitchen set up by one of the residents who, uh, you know, people would bring their stuff and then they'd make a big meal for everybody who wanted it. Um, folks would have kind of like salon time in their essentially sitting rooms in the front of their homes to connect over things. Um, and those really get erased from the narrative of, oh, well, there were a bunch of homeless people living in this park and we cleaned them up. Not, oh, there's this community that has challenges, but also is a community. And that we really see through these through the way that people constructed their homes um, and also through the kinds of materials that were left behind that actually have been cleaned up since. Um, so we were working kind of concurrently with cleanup days that would come through and pick up trash that we were trying to document because it revealed, you know, in one particular home site, I was working with a group of landscape architects who had come to sort of learn archaeological methods. And a few of them were kind of like, why am I tromping around this trashy, overgrown site? Um, and it took until they reached down and they picked up a contact case for them to say, oh, people lived here. People were taking care of themselves in, in whatever ways they could. And in this case, that meant you know, getting and having and using contact cases or having pets. And we find a lot of, um, you know, pet food cans and things like that. And all of those things are homogenized out of the category. Those are, those are marvelous details to remind us um, of, of the realities. Mm -hmm. um, we do have two more questions. I'm not sure what your time frame is. I know you have another obligation coming up. Um, um, I'm doing. I'm doing great. <laughs> doing great on time. Okay, so we do have two more questions, and we'll we'll close it down after those two um, to preserve your your uh, time. Um, but Danielle is asking, how are you able to distinguish items in the yards that were affiliated with the evicted residents from the unaffiliated sort of surface scatter? Were the yard spaces demarcated in some way and the ob objects distinguishable as personal items that were hurriedly abandoned? That's a great question. Um, how we were disable, disabled, how we were able to identify personal belongings is exactly the way we would do it in any other archeological site. We looked for those concentrations, patterns and spatial relationships between things. And this was so recently a home that we had that added benefit that the patterns were extremely clear. So if you've ever gone to, um, you know, a recently disused place 
there are plenty of them in New England, old barns, you know, whatever. If you have that archaeological mindset, you start putting the picture together quite quickly. And we we were able to delineate where structures had been based on post holes, based on tent stakes still in the ground, based on, um, you know, um, uh, compacted earth. And within those spaces, the patterns of artifacts changed. So they didn't represent a sort of random scatter of trash. Moreover, the dump itself was strictly construction materials, not household trash. So why would a CD-ROM be in trash that came from dismantling a public building in the city, right? Um, or making new BART tracks, the public transit tracks. Um, so it actually was not that difficult. Um, one of the interesting aspects of that is that people uh, often when they visited the bulb would pick things up and move them around and sort of create art out of them. And so one of the things we did was we tried to sort of identify which aspects were potentially like collaborative art projects of you know, gluing a thing you found at the bulb onto a big piece of concrete and which were individual. And again, it was that spatial relationship between places where people were living, even though we know that folks at the bulb were also making art. Um, the yard spaces were demarcated. A lot of them had that same kind of brick planter feature around them or plants that were clearly tended as opposed to let grown wild. Um, sort of transplanted to particular areas, spatial relationships, right? Um, you, you see where a doormat used to be and then right in front of it, there's some, some planter beds. Um, the uh, sort of objects that were in them also helped us identify that. So rocks and stones and, and shells collected and sort of um, put over the, the surface of the planting area which is if you walk around the city of Albany, you see the exact same thing, brick, la brick lined planter beds with your little gnome and you know rocks and, and things like that. So, um, so you know, we just used that systematic attention in order to identify these things. That, that's wonderful. And, and I really appreciate your discussion of having the, the landscape architects um, come in and, and use this also as a learning space um, for, for understanding the archaeological methodology and, and mindset. Um, our last question comes from Yvonne, and I really like this one because I, I do a lot of advocacy work uh, and public policy work now. Um, but she says, thank you for raising the lack of humanity associated with our language usage with homeless people and their homes. Do you have any recommendations for public policy based on your work? I do. And in fact, the folks who live there have the best ones. Um, and so I am essentially translating what they've told me and then what the archaeology helped me as a non a person not experiencing homelessness um, understand. So I think that one of the things um, in terms of public policy for folks experiencing homelessness that really made the bulb an important place for a lot of people is that they were allowed to control their community and their homes in terms of what they were like, where they were, the amount of privacy they needed. Um, and for a lot of people, the setting itself in this, you know, one of the most beautiful places in the San Francisco Bay, I think, was really important to folks who were struggling with mental health issues. Um, and that's not always taken into consideration when things like shelter systems or public housing are proposed as solutions. Um, again, this sort of homogenizing of the category of people that need to be put up somewhere um, can be challenging for folks who living in an apartment building is not gonna work given their individual situation or not being able to connect with 
outside areas that are green or have fresh air, um, which is a known issue. But this research really draws draws out how folks, by and large, you know, want to create their spaces. Um, they want to have that sense of ownership and personhood and creativity. Um, that's not, it's definitely not allowed in the shelter system. You can't even bring your belongings, you know, in with you most of the time. Um, and in fact, when these evictions were happening, the city did provide a trailer that had cots in it and a shower. Um, and nobody stayed in it. Because it was loud, it was noisy, the lighting was weird, you were sleeping right next to someone else, you couldn't keep your stuff safe. Um, and it was a waste of the city's resources. They could have taken the money that they spent on that trailer and helped folks um, connect with services and um, income streams and things like that. Well, I think that that's that's you know the some of the most interesting archaeological work really does have this you know uh, perspective on the past and this ability to to cast important ideas forward. So we really want to thank you for your time, Dr. Danis, today and and your thoughtfulness in this research and in answering the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them this afternoon. Um, before we go, I just want to thank everyone who has been with us this afternoon uh, and to let you know that we're looking forward to hosting uh, Jasmine Mathis on Wednesday, November 9th. Um, she'll be speaking about the Atwater Kent collection, part of the former Philadelphia History Museum um, collection now housed at Drexel University. Uh, and again, I want to thank everyone um, for their support and their attention. Uh, and I hope that this um, this research in particular goes forward and, and helps uh, inspire some greater understanding of, of the communities that we tend to ignore um, or, or tend to deride. Um, and, and more and work in this in the archaeology of the contemporary. <laughs> exactly. Well, I hope maybe we can have you back on digging in to, to just talk about the, that concept um, as something that is so exciting and so new. So thank you, Dr. Danis. Thank you to everyone. And uh, we look forward to having you uh, at our next Digging In. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Thanks so much.